started. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, beautiful people, depending on wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us for this live event virtually. And thank you to those of you who are watching this event recording after the fact. Welcome to you too. The military invasion in Ukraine has caused fresh risks to global food security in a context of already sharp increases in food prices. Shortages for key staples like wheat and vegetable oils may emerge as the conflict continues to escalate, putting further upward pressure on food prices and that could cause millions more people to live in hunger. Such grave consequences only increase the importance of addressing food loss and waste. Every year, about a third of all food produced is either lost during production, distribution, and processing or wasted at the retail and consumer level. With 811 million people facing hunger in 2020, this food loss and waste is egregious. Food loss and waste also has significant negative environmental impacts, accounting for almost 10% of global GHG emissions, as well as a wasteful use of a quarter of the world's freshwater resources and of farmland that exceeds the size of China. Sustainable Development Goal Target 12.3 calls for halving per capita global food waste at the retail and consumer levels and reducing food losses along production and supply chains, including post-harvest losses by 2030. Yes, well said, Rachel. Uh, and I think the, the 2021 UN Food System Summit highlighted very well the importance of reducing food loss and waste to achieve a sustainable food system and deliver on all 17 sustainable development goals. But what are effective solutions for a livable planet and to guarantee sufficient and healthy food for future generations. What needs to change in production processes? What can and should consumers uh, like myself do? And how can all generations get involved? Uh, at today's seminar, we will post questions and engage in a dialogue with a panel of leaders uh, from the farm, from business, uh, policy communities to push forward the global discussions uh, of workable solutions. How can we truly change this towards the better? Uh, and we would like to hear from you as well. So to participate in the question and answer session that will follow the panel discussion, uh, so it comes right after it, please submit your questions on ifpry.org, uh, on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag uh, ASKIFPRI on Twitter. Uh, and I would like to give the floor to Rachel also to give the opening uh, to, to introduce herself and also to introduce the first panelist. All right. Welcome once again, everyone. I am Rachel. I will be one of your moderators today. You just heard from Lisana. Lisana, say hey real quick. Hi. <laughs> she will also be moderating with me. And we're just so, so, so excited to be here with you. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a fantastic session for sure. We're going to hand the floor over to His Excellency Mikhail Dam Schwartz, the Minister Councillor for Food, Agriculture and Fisheries from the Embassy of Denmark, to give us the welcome remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, Lisan. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I'm quite excited to kick off today's event on food loss and food waste. It's a key challenge for our food system. Uh, please allow me on the note of the introduction as well to state that we in Denmark, as many of us are shocked by the ongoing invasion in Ukraine and feeling with the Ukrainian people and all who are impacted by the conflict, even though we today focus on food loss and waste. So food loss and waste could potentially feed 2 billion people. That corresponds to one third of the food produced. This is well known by you all. A reduction in food loss and waste can play a significant role in reducing the environmental footprint. This requires a shift in consumption patterns and actions of all of us across the value chains, not least with the increasing pressure on food supply chains due to growing populations and the effects of climate change. 
Policymakers, businesses, and consumers invested in the climate agenda have to turn talk into concrete actions if we are to be taken seriously by the younger generations calling for change. We need to, as we see it, through conversation and concrete actions, move from Greta Thunberg's statement of blah, 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 to a feeling of hope and action. Actually, I discussed climate change with my son. He just turned 13 this weekend. And he tends to say that my solutions are unrealistic and he thinks chances are best for him living on Mars in the future. That depresses me a bit and I don't want to have him living that far away. So I think it's important we, we engage in solutions also for the future generations. In the framework of the UN Sustainability Development Goals, we all share a responsibility in reaching the 2030 goal and cut the food loss and waste in half. We still have a long way to go, and today we'll be operational and look into what solutions are at hand in combating food loss and waste. Our speakers will add different perspectives on the issue as they represent and work with different aspects of the food production and consumption chain. I'm very pleased and happy to welcome our young change makers as well to moderate the event and give their perspectives on the agenda. They have agreed to be the voice of the younger generations on today's event. I would also like to thank our co-organizers, the World Resource Institute and the International Food Policy Research Institute for their huge efforts in organizing the event with the Embassy of Denmark and their devotion to this agenda. And last but not least, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our speakers and panelists. We are very happy for your participation, not least uh, having such capacities uh, being with, with, with us here today. As a closing remark and invitation, in Denmark, we are only 5.7 million people, a city in the US. And as a small country, we try to do our part from the government, the business side in supporting the Sustainable Development Goal 12.3, reaching an overall reduction of food loss and waste by 50%. And we aim to punch above our weight and try to be an accelerator of the actions to transform the food system to become more sustainable and responsible. And therefore, on the 5th and 6th of May 2022, the Minister of Food and Agriculture and Fisheries, Mr. Rasmus Prehn, will host the 6th Annual World Food Summit. We all hope to see you again in May. Thank you so much for joining us. I look very much forward to the next hour and a half discussing solutions on food loss and waste with you. Thank you so much for that, Minister Schwartz. Uh, we hope to find some solutions today that will prove your son wrong and have him stay here on Earth with us. <laughs> Not sure what life on Mars would be like, but I know we'll find out soon. All right, now we'd like to hand it over to His Excellency Rasmus Prehn, the Minister for Food, Agriculture and Fisheries in Denmark. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words at this seminar on food loss and waste. In these difficult times, it is more important than ever to come together and work together. I'm sure we can all agree that the theme of this seminar could not be more relevant. As the world population grows, the Earth resources are coming under increasing pressure. And we know that a reduction of our food loss and waste is an important part of the solution. At today's seminar, a number of young people have been invited to challenge a panel of representatives from different parts of the food chain and raise their concerns and ask questions. This, I believe, is the best way to approach this issue. Our youth is the future 
and they hold the key to a food loss and waste revolution. We need to listen to them. It gives me hope when I see the power, the dedication and the passion behind young people's contribution to the climate debate. And they are completely right when they accuse the generation before them, my generation, of not doing enough to tackle the climate crisis. They demand change. The UN Food Systems Summit in September was a landmark opportunity for us to reach concrete and scalable results and progress towards such a change. I was pleased to see a strong coalition coming together in the context of the summit. With the aim to elevate efforts to a global scale, the Food is Never Waste coalition was established. A coalition where every member, despite the different starting points, has agreed to focus on tackling food loss and waste as a priority. And the aim is high to halve food waste by 2030 and reduce food losses by at least 25%. A few weeks after the Food Systems Summit on September 29th, it was the International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste. On this day, Denmark also has its own National Food Waste Day with the aim to raise consumer awareness. This day was celebrated all around the country. As for myself, I was hosting the official, the official opening event where our focus was on youth. The thing that stays with me after this event is the depth of commitment many young people carry with regard to climate change. They are worried about the future and with good reason. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance that we keep momentum and keep working together to commit and involve all stakeholders throughout the entire food value chain to tackle the food loss and waste challenge. In May this year, Denmark will host the World Food Summit 2022 where leaders and experts will gather to discuss the link between food systems and climate change and food loss and waste will be a central subject again this year. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us keep on working. Let us keep momentum. There are no easy solutions, no easy fix, and the journey will take time. Therefore, let us collaborate across nations so we together can convert this global challenge into an opportunity for ourselves and for the generations to come. We can do this together. Thank you. He has a very powerful statement. Um, as, already, as he said, the aim is very high, but I think, uh, yeah, although there's no easy fix, I think is we work together also between generations. So not only the youth, not only the not youth, <laughs> um, I think that we can achieve a lot. And I think the coalition that was mentioned already is a huge step forward uh, in transforming um, and reducing food loss and waste. Uh, and with that, I would like to introduce the second, uh, the next speaker, uh, and that is Maximo Troero. He's a chief economist uh, from the Food and Agricultural Organization. And I also would like to thank him for his uh, support 
very much in the World Food Forum as well, um, where uh, yeah, both Rachel and I have been uh, involved in or are involved in. So with that, I would like to give the floor to you, uh, Maximo. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me well. L let me yeah. uh, share my screen. I have a small PowerPoint because I, I want to bring some of the latest information we have. I hope you can see the, the, the presentation. Can you see it? Perfect. Yeah, thank you. OK, great. So basically, in these five minutes, what, what I will try to do is to try to bring the latest information that we have. Uh, because as all has been saying, uh, it doesn't make any sense to have the level of losses we have today, given the level, level of hunger. We have 811 million people hungry. How the food prices are today, uh, how much are they rising, and how complicated is the situation of what we are observing, and how complicated it is going to become because of the conflict that we are observing. So uh, this is one of the cases where this is completely nonsense. It shouldn't be happening. We need to find a way to reduce uh, losses and waste. And, and it's important because of three reasons. It's not only economic in the sense that you can recover those losses and opportunity cost of that and farmers can be better, but it's also important in terms of, of emissions, of environmental emissions and use of our natural resources, but also, of course, achieve social progress by providing more healthy diets uh, to people. Uh, and that's uh, exactly what we want to do. So food loss and waste reduction is a triple win. And in the Food Systems Summit, when we did the assessment of the potential impacts of different policies, food loss and waste came as the one that could really bring this triple win with the minimum trade-offs. And that's why it's so important when we talk about, about this topic. Now, what are the, 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 the estimates that we have? Uh, the last estimate we produced, which was uh, after the one third, of course, that FAO produced, uh, it was what we issued in, in, in the SOFA uh, 2016, which was a 13.8% of losses. We have reestimate uh, the model with the current data of 2020, and today we are talking of 13.3. So there has been a reduction, but the reduction has been uh, very small. But it has helped us also to, to improve with this with new data and with we're using also artificial intelligence to be able to capture the level of losses. It has also allowed us to be able to have more information on where and how the losses are occurring. Uh, and we have been able to estimate uh, better now the global distribution and the regional distribution of the losses. Uh, and this is the ranking uh, by region uh, and by the world. So as I mentioned before, uh, the losses are 13.3. Uh, but uh, the first ranking region with 21.4 is, is Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where high losses are estimated in, in all food groups. And this is the region where the bigger number of food crisis countries exist. Again, this enormous contradiction that we are facing. Uh, several regions experience losses between 13% and 15%, uh, and in Eastern and Southern Eastern Asia, for example, Oceania, uh, and so on. And finally, Latin America and the Caribbean and North America and Europe have lower food loss percentages than the global average of 12.3 and 9.9% respectively. Now, it's again, it's important that I am talking of losses here. I'm not talking of waste. And it's very important to be very careful in the definition. Losses is up to wholesale included, and waste is from retail to, to consumers. Uh, one of the IFPRI colleagues, uh, Luciana de Gagao, has just finished her dissertation on this topic and looks carefully at the definition so that we can be careful measuring the losses across the value chain, and that's extremely extremely important when we talk about, about this topic. Now, if we want to help countries implement effective solutions for, for a livable planet, we need to hear what they envision for themselves with respect to food loss and waste reduction. And this is first-hand information, comes from the National Pathways of the Food System Summit, and basically is trying to analyze what the dialogues and the transformational pathways of the Food System Summit at the country level were saying. And over the course of 18 months, hundreds of thousands of people from around the world, as you know, and across all constituencies have engaged with the Food Systems Summit to accelerate action uh, to transform food systems to achieve 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development. And outcomes of the dialogues inform the articulation of the national pathways. And these pathways can serve as point of reference across governments and for all stakeholders. So if, if we look at the priority areas for action, at the means of implementation and at a preliminary instruction from some interventions that countries identify with respect to food loss and waste reduction. The map and the dashboard uh, that you see have been developed by, by FAO to try to do some analytics on this with this data lab. And it still shows us how important the topic it is. And, we, and when we go in deep and look into food loss and waste reduction, 
many of the countries are showing exactly and are demanding for this. And that's where we need to work uh, together with the Champions 12.3, with the, with the uh, uh, Never Waste Coalition, and with all the work that all the different organizations are doing to try to achieve uh, the goal that we want to achieve in terms of, of, of reduction uh, and losses. Now, this uh, a preliminary analysis of the pathways document uh, that has been carried by, by us uh, has, has shown certain results. First, uh, the chart is based on, on, table, on a table where the objective and measures from the 75 pathways were manually extracted and measures were grouped in 12 categories, objective or, or action areas are often mentioned without a means of implementation. And it's still a work that is in progress, but again, it tells us how important uh, this topic is and how much we need to look in, into this topic in, in the future. So this is the way we believe we can uh, select and work. And what you can observe in this graph is how in different ways, uh, topics that are directly related to food losses or directly related to the process in the value chain are targeted. And here is where the value of doing the analysis in detail in the value chain for the case of losses is central. We need to identify where are those hotspots and we need to identify metrics to be able to achieve uh, the goals that we want to achieve. So my, my major conclusion here is that here we have a case of a triple win, no matter the size of the country, no matter the develop, level of development. In some regions, of course, waste is more relevant, but in all of them, losses and waste are relevant. Maybe these middle income, high income, low income countries even seats. And that's where we need to work together to try to bring the metrics and the tools, and that's extremely important, the, the work on metrics, to identify where the losses occur, and then start to look at solutions to those problems. We did a, an assessment of all the different interventions, for example, on post-harvest losses, and the cost effectiveness were, were very, very, very small. That means that we need still to better identify the problem and to find the proper solution to minimize that. And that's where the private sector has to play a crucial role. They are the ones that have to bring the solution. But we, as a public good agency generator, we have to create information to facilitate that process. And that's, I think, the major role we have in place. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you for this for this introduction for this uh, this really great presentation with showing a lot of data and a really really great summary and a database that you created here. A really uh, yeah really impressive to see this. Yeah, um, yeah. so crucial to see the data. Listen, isn't that right? Data is always good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I would like to remind you all um, that you can tune in live. And, and for those who are tuning in live, uh, that you can submit your brief question on ifpri.org, uh, on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, or by using the hashtag, um, hashtag ASKIFPRI uh, on Twitter. And we will, be coming, we will be coming to the question and answer session uh, very soon after the panel discussion. And yes. I would like to the floor then back to Rachel to introduce that. Thanks, Lisanna. Before, even before we do that, we have to hear from one more person. I know you guys are like, what? So many amazing speakers today. Um, but our last speaker, and thank you again, Maximo, for the data, for the facts, for letting us know what's happening. Um, and thank you also for always supporting our youth. We appreciate it. We would like to introduce Mr. Rob Voss, the Director for Markets, Trade and Institutions of the IFPRI. So, Mr. Voss, Rob, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rachel and Lisan, first of all, for hosting this event. Uh, we very much look forward to the panel discussion. Um, yeah, I'm a bit embarrassed to be another speaker uh, before we get to the actual uh, discussion. Um, as you all have already um, laid out very well, the importance of reducing food loss and waste for improving um, the sustainability of food systems um, and deal with the inefficiencies. Um, what uh, you have already mentioned and others also have emphasized, uh, we're seeing today with the invasion in Ukraine and the ramifications this is having on uh, food prices and actually on food security uh, across the world. So it just shows the vulnerability 
of our globally uh, integrated uh, food systems. Uh, we also saw that uh, during the first months of COVID-19, when uh, food, sub very, uh, su food supply chains buckled, uh, both shocks to demand and disruptions in production and distribution uh, caused substantial food losses. Um, uh, this happened in the United States uh, with uh, enormous amounts of milk and meat that had to be uh, thrown away because of uh, shifts in demand because of closures, restaurants and schools that uh, no, were no longer demanding uh, those products. Um, we also saw it in, in poor countries like Mali, where curfews were imposed because of COVID-19 and the transportation of food, fruits, vegetables and meats that would normally take place at night um, now had to be done uh, during uh, the day uh, because of the uh, curfew and uh, because of, importantly, the lack of refrigerated storage and uh, transport uh, availability, and hence uh, causing enormous uh, losses uh, along the way. Um, but one thing I also learned from the pandemic is that we've seen food systems adjusting swiftly and we have not seen um, severe food shortages per se that have emerged during the pandemic, uh, which is also a sign of resilience of food systems. Of course, we have seen an uh, enormous increase in food insecurity, but mainly because of uh, the income and employment losses people have suffered during COVID, the COVID recession, and because of the rising food prices during the uneven recovery from that recession. recession. So what I would like to emphasize how in, uh, in my brief uh, remarks is uh, how we will deal with this paradox of food systems that are both very resilient and uh, can adjust to crisis and are yet highly vulnerable uh, to um, any shock that we see to food systems. Um, so it, it underscores why we should look at the conditions of the entire food supply chain and the food system functioning when we find solutions for reducing food loss and waste. And let me emphasize the four priority areas of action that has come out from the research that we've been undertaking at uh, IFPRI on this front. Uh, very briefly, I'll go through those four areas. First, we need better integrated supply chains, particularly in developing countries, especially where there are weak links um, in critical parts of the supply chain, I already mentioned uh, uh, cold chain uh, development. Um, um, and, uh, but <clears throat> even if, um, uh, as the data from FAO shows that food losses typically occur, occur at the farm level, they mostly happen because of the supply chain bottlenecks beyond the farm. Uh, because of lack of uh, market access, uh, but also be because of a lack of adequate storage space and uh, transportation. Second, uh, what's very important is the right market incentives uh, are equally important as improving the value chain infrastructure. We found that in countries like Tanzania and Nigeria, maize farmers do make rational economic decisions regarding whether they adopt or not adopt better post-harvest handling practices and storage capacity. Uh, but very often, because of other constraints, um, like lack of market access, they uh, won't do that, um, uh, or because of uh, unstable prices, uh, and hence uh, what we need is proper market incentives for them to adopt uh, better practices along the food value chain. The third element is better regulation and incentives to preserve uh, product quality. Um, this can be very effective to reduce food losses and also food uh, waste. Uh, in fact, our research and work um, that we've done show that um, um, uh, the food losses are often not so much about the quantities of loss of food, the food that is lost, but about the food quality. So in that regard, we tested the effect of the quality-based contractual arrangements and product quality certification that can be applied uh, along the food supply chain. We found that, for instance, in beans production in Guatemala, uh, that helped to significantly improve both the food quality uh, consumed by consumers and substantially helped to reduce food quality uh, losses uh, along the supply chain. And fourth and lastly, back to the COVID crisis and the Ukraine crisis, uh, that has shown that um, if we don't have uh, ease of market access and greater flexibility 
for producers and for traders and distributors to cope with sudden shocks, um, then um, the food system may end up in, uh, in constraints. So, uh, for instance, the uh, flexibility for producers and distributors to shift between food uh, market segments to avoid trade restrictions uh, that typically lead to higher food prices, as well as um, to avoid food losses if traders cannot timely diversify to other markets. So, in sum, um, the recommendation is, uh, can we think of the solutions that work not just at a specific level, be it at the farm level, the consumer level, but actually that need to work throughout the uh, food and agricultural the supply chains, um, rather than uh, specifically um, um, focusing on interventions that only look at how can we reduce, reduce food loss and waste, but rather how can we improve the entire functioning of supply chains. I know that's easier said than done, so very much look forward to the panel discussion and hear from the practitioners, from the views like uh, the young uh, entrepreneurial people like you, Rachel and Lizanne, uh, to see how we can uh, help reduce food loss and waste for better food security, the health of our environment and for economic prosperity. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Voss. As you said, Rob, so much easier said than done. That seems to be a common theme right now with everything going on in the world. But what's good is that there are people like you and me and everyone on this call who are willing to do the work, even though it's not easy, it's worth it. So that being said, ready for this exciting segment where we're gonna get a chance to hear from our panelists. Even before we get there, Lisana and I will also be moderating this section, and I'm sure some of you are a bit curious about the two of us. So I'm Rachel, I am from Jamaica, representing the Every Mickle Foundation and also the World Food Forum as a WFF champion. Lisana, would you like to introduce yourself quickly? Yes, yeah, certainly, thank you. Uh, so my name is Lisana van Oosterhout, I'm from the Netherlands. And I'm, uh, as well as Rachel, a youth champion from the World Food Forum, as well as a European Climate Pact ambassador in the Netherlands, and also for my daily work focusing on technological innovation uh, in relation to agri-food systems. So thank yeah. you. Um, and also very much looking forward to our panel discussion and to all the panelists that will be involved. going to be great. Great. Also, Lisana is a star. I don't know if you guys could tell, but she really is. And you as um, well. So our panelists, <laughs> thanks, Lisana. Our panelists today are going to be Theo Dieger, who is president of the World Farm Organization, followed by Yolanda Kakabatsi, former president of the World Wildlife Fund International, WWF, and former minister of environment for the Republic of Ecuador. We're also going to hear from Metallica, the CEO of Too Good To Go, and Ken West, Reefer Digital Development Manager for Mersk. I know, so many good things in store. Um, first and foremost, I have a question for Theo Dieger, who's the president of the World Pharma Organization. Theo, hi, welcome. Hi, My thank question you for having for you. me. Yay, so happy to see you. My question for you, Theo, and honestly, Lisana and I are not going to take it easy on the panelists tomorrow, today, I said tomorrow, today, right now, <laughs> because as mentioned by Dr. Voss earlier, it's not an easy situation. So here's a question for you, Theo. Food losses at early stages of the supply chain are still a very, very big problem. Most of these losses happen at the farm level, posing a big cost to farmers. What are the main causes of this food loss and what can farmers do to decrease it? Thank you for a very difficult question and I'm not going to risk a simple answer on it. When, when, when you talk about food loss, what farmers hear is financial loss because what is lost on the farm actually comes from our pocket. Somebody still pays for it and that would be us before it leaves the farm gates. And there are mainly three reasons why food losses occur. The, the, the first reason is about technology. 
And I really enjoyed the data which Maximo has shown to us, because on that data you could very clearly see that those countries which have embraced technologies and where farmers implement high technology are those countries with less food losses. While countries and areas on the globe where we have less uh, technologically advanced agricultural practices are those where we have more food loss. Even the most advanced harvesters still lose a lot of the grain on the field. There is no perfect machine that can bring down food loss to zero. But then it's not only in the process of harvesting. There's a lot of loss in the production process and there's a lot of losses post-harvest, like in the storage, um, in the cold chain, in the logistics, up to the farm gate and beyond that. And then of course, nature is also partly to blame for some of the losses. We have a lot of losses from insects, from birds, from uh, animals, from earthborne disease and other diseases. And then there's temperature, too much heat, too much cold, too much wind, too much light, which also causes some uh, losses to the extent that some fruits or some vegetables, some grains no longer meet the standards as set by the consumers. And the final word, you know, you want to change food systems in the world, you start with the consumers. You want to reduce food loss and waste, you start with the consumers, because we all farm into value chains. And the only reason we, we talk about chains is because you cannot push a chain. You can only pull it. And the pulling force is the market. If the market would take up more ugly fruits, for example, we can reduce food loss. If the market demands from farmers higher standards, farmers have no other uh, um, alternative than to abide by higher standards all the time. Farmers would always do what the market will buy from them. Thank you. Wow, thank you. I mean, I can clearly see why you are here. Um, I love how visual you were with some of the explanations. It made it very easy to understand and that very much complemented all the data that Maximo presented to us earlier. You cannot push a chain, you can only pull it. It's very true. Never thought about that before. Um, I have one more question for you, if that's okay. Here the question is, how do you see the role of food subsidies at farm level in relation to food loss and waste on the farms? You know, Rachel, it's not many farmers in the world who have the benefit of subsidies. It's actually a very small group of farmers in the world, and it's mostly farmers from the more advanced countries, so more advanced production systems. Um, subsidies create incentives. In some countries, subsidies are being utilized to lure farmers into better practices, but it also assists farmers to procure better technologies. It helps farmers to take to go to that next level. But of course, it creates an uneven playing field in as much as some farmers or farmers elsewhere in the world who do not have the benefit of subsidies must still compete with those who are subsidized. But it is so that governments who get involved in the value chain by means of either subsidies or by paying for some of the support systems such as research and development, the creation of infrastructure. Those governments usually also harvest the benefit of a stronger food system. And it is so important that the discussion gets going. Each one of us is every day in competition with the best other farmers in the world. And food and fiber is flowing across the world as if there are no borders. And this is why 
when we talk about subsidies and when we talk about technologies and access to markets, that, that, that we must respect uh, ever smaller world and the real rules around that. In a discussion such as we are having today, I would have loved the World Trade Organization to be part of it again, uh, um, or to be part of it also, because we can only reduce food loss and waste if trade in the world is on a sound foundation and if the rules are very clear and are abided by. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I'm sure we'll take note and ensure that the World Trade Organization will be present next time. They can't miss it. Um, thank you, Theo, for that, for your insight, for your wisdom, for your experience and your commitment to this movement. I'm going to hand it over to Lisana, who will have amazing questions for our next panelist. Yeah, thank you. And also, thank you very much for this this insight from the farmer view. And I would like to introduce then now Yolanda Kakabatsi. Uh, she's former president from the World Wildlife Fund International uh, and former minister of environment for the Republic of Ecuador. And Yolanda, I first want to thank you for all you are doing and have been doing. Uh, and I would like to start with the first question to you. And we already heard a little bit about it. It was mentioned already earlier uh, because at the UN Food System Summit, uh, a coalition was formed, uh, which was named Food Never Waste, Food is Never Waste. Uh, and my question to you is, what is different about this coalition and why would it make a difference, for instance, comparing this uh, with what you could have done when you were Minister of the Environment of Ecuador? <laughs> uh, thank you for that great question and, and good day to everybody. Um, what is different uh, today or, and why is this, this agenda so important? And basically because it is a bottom up response. I, I feel that the struggle, the fight against food loss and waste is something that belongs to society, to the citizen, to the consumer. Every single human being is a consumer and not everybody is a producer. So th there is a logic of the response coming from the people. And, and why, why was this um, so important in the last couple of decades and today is because it touches on so many values. It touches on, on those values that are expressed in the SDGs. It touches on poverty, on uh, justice, on environment and water and soil, nature. Uh, on the climate crisis. And of course it touches on human values such as solidarity. Um, I, I'm afraid that uh, the numbers are growing. When we put food loss and waste together, the latest data is 40, four zero percent of food produced around the world is lost. So it is, it is another type of crisis that brought together many actors around the world around the food system summit and the big difference i think of this coalition with other coalitions is that the expertise and the experience of the people who are uh, who have joined and are joining the coalition is is long the experience comes from 10, 20 years ago. And so the, the summit allowed us to get together and to express and, uh, the, our concerns, but also to express um, the, and share experiences and, and lessons learned. So you know, this is a, a coalition that, is a, that broke new ground several decades ago and that now has a great moment and opportunity to even uh, strengthen the ties that are absolutely necessary uh, uh, around the world to, to improve, to gain uh, the strength and the force that we need. And of course, when I was minister in 1998, this was not spoken about. We referred to the food agenda 
um, through the, the topic of uh, uh, agrochemicals or uh, um, deforestation in order to, to grow the, the agricultural landscape. And palm oil and, and, and those were the big, the big uh, issues of debate, but we did not have an agenda like the one we have today that concentrates on identifying the problems around food loss and waste and defining what actions do we need to take from the government, of course, with the support of the government, but mainly through social action. Thanks so much. It's really great to hear you talk with so much passion. It's <laughs> yeah, that's it's amazing. Um, and I also yeah, I think what I hear is that we this coalition really unites around the quiet crisis, but also with different expertises in different levels and from bottom up and top down coming together. That's that's what I hear here. Um, and uh, another question to you, uh, which ties a, a little bit. Um, because what strategies do you think could be implemented on a governmental level um, to decrease food loss and waste uh, and also decrease the, the impact of it on the environment? Do you have some examples? Um, absolutely. I think the role of the government is manifold. One is law, public policy, regulations, but also creating platforms for the different actors to get together. Um, this discussion and this action cannot be achieved if there, if all the, if the key actors are not sitting around the table. The, the producers, uh, the agricultural sector, the, the, the markets, uh, NGOs, the consumers, and of course, local and national governments um, that need to support all these actions through uh, policies. But in addition to that, I would say at the global level, we need the global governance also to, to um, be part of this debate, basically because there are so many good experiences around the world that needs to need to be shared. Uh, I don't think we need to create from scratch. Um, this is not rocket science anymore. And, and uh, the possibility of sharing experiences and lessons learned and what to do, what to replicate and how to replicate is part of the key of the solution. I love that you say this as well, because also in my own work, actually, we're now talking a lot about there's already so much, so, so many solutions are already out there, but we need to start implement them. We need to start using what is there and see what is still missing and start from there. So that's, that's right. Yeah, thanks a lot for this. Um, and I would like to remind you all again um, that you can, for tuning, who are tuning in live, that you can submit your question, uh, your brief question to this panel um, on the ifpri.org, uh, on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, or by using the hashtag AskEFPRI uh, on Twitter. Uh, and we will hear from two more panelists, and then we will move on to the question and answers where we will be, we'll be answering all of your questions, or at least we try to uh, answer as many of them as we can. And I would like to give the floor again to Rachel to introduce the next panelist. I'm so excited for this next panelist. Um, it's going to be Meta Luca. Uh, the CEO of Too Good To Go, Meta. Thank you so much for being here. I remember when I was living in Barcelona, my sister asked me if I had downloaded this app, Too Good To Go, and I hadn't. I hadn't heard of it. Once I did, it was a game changer. So thank you for changing my life while I was in Barcelona. No big deal. Um, but for those who are unfamiliar with Too Good To Go, Meta, could you tell us how you guys are addressing food waste? How is Too Good To Go addressing food waste? Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Thank you for inviting me. So Too Good To Go is a social impact company. And uh, really, we dream of a planet with no food waste. That's our North Star. And our contribution so far is that we've built a marketplace for surplus food. So any food that a baker or a supermarket or any other food store is not able to sell at normal price. They can basically put on sale on Too Good To Go 
and one of our waste warriors will come and pick it up and, and buy it at a discount and thereby save the food. So we are building one of those marketplaces that I think Yolanda talked about that we need. We are connecting the supplier side with the consumer side. Uh, and the, the status right now is that we operate in 17 countries. Uh, so we're in 15 countries in Europe and then US and Canada. We have uh, 53 million users uh, on the platform. Uh, and on the supply side, we work with uh, more than 100,000 stores that actively uh, put their food up for, uh, for saving on a monthly basis. Um, the way we really think about this is that the, the marketplace we have and all the food that we save there on, on a daily basis, and that's currently about 230,000 meals, that, that's really our direct impact. Uh, and that's quite measurable and, and very tangible. But then we also think that we have an opportunity to play a bigger role in solving uh, the issue of food loss and waste. And, and that's what we call our indirect impact. Uh, so because we have so many stores and now more than 50 million consumers, we have an opportunity to actually reach them. And the ambition is to first inspire them. Uh, so that's really making people aware about the issue of food waste and also make the connection to the environment, because I think most people sadly still don't make that connection. Uh, so that's the first thing. And then empower them by actually giving them tools to do something. So of course, one of those tools is our app, a free app to download across the, both platforms. But it's also things like, um, it can be as simple as sharing uh, tips uh, in our social media channels, which have quite significant following by now, where we share tips on what's the best recipes when you have bread that's left over, or you know how do you better plan your shopping? How do you store your food at home? So, uh, things like that, because you know when it comes to the consumer side, it is relatively simple things that we uh, that we need to change in terms of habits. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So along those lines, the consumer habits and using bread and all of those things, I have a quick question for you regarding consumer behavior. It's very, very hard to change food habits of consumers, especially if you're not fully aware of how you're impacting the environment or society. What can we as individuals do to help change those food habits? And have you seen any signs of hope for change or is it completely hopeless? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's completely hopeless for sure. I think, I think really there is, there is a big information task still, uh, but I'm also aware that definitely the informational campaigns are not going to cut it. We've tried that too many times on a standalone basis. So we need those tools and we need to empower people uh, as well. Um, and I think, I think there are signs uh, that are positive. I think we saw around COVID that there was this renewed interest for food and maybe a slightly renewed respect around it when the supply chains uh, start, uh, started getting a bit challenged. So I think we also saw during COVID and maybe, uh, and, and we see again when, when the world is, uh, is coming a bit apart, that when, when we all come together and agree that something is really important and a priority we are actually able to move more than we maybe would have thought we were able to so i think you know some of some of that uh, momentum we saw around COVID for us was sign that you know if at some point we all agree that climate is the thing to solve then uh, then there should be opportunities uh, to actually move mountains uh, a lot faster which of course we need uh, i think we are also doing things where uh, we try to address these, um, this issue from different angles. So part of this indirect impact, for example, has been to say, why, why is so much food wasted in the households? And one reason is that con consumers are confused about date labeling. So they don't understand the difference between use by and best before. So what we've done is with our connections, we've created alliances now across 10 countries where we work with uh, the likes of Nestlé and Unilever and some of the biggest producers to actually improve the date labeling on their products and make it more clear to consumers that 
even if it says best before, all that means is that you need to use your senses. You look at it, you smell it, you taste it, and you decide if you want to eat it. You don't have to throw it out just because it hit that date. If it's a best before product, there's no health risk associated. At worst, you will have a bad experience, but I, I promise you will get over it. But really using, using our, um, our foundation to create awareness like that, so we've done this in 10 countries and uh, this labeling is now on uh, more than 4,000 different products. Uh, so in total, it's 845 million products is the latest count out there uh, in the supermarkets. So I think that that's, a, that's maybe another more positive example of how we can actually change things uh, and, and do good uh, in the process. Thank you so much for that, Meta. I'm definitely a big fan of the see and smell test for food. Um, no bad experiences so far, but thanks for your insight. Thank you for being a food warrior yourself. I have to shout out my sister, Ceci, for having me download this app. And I especially would recommend to all of those who are on the call, if this app is available where you are, please download it and use it. I promise you it's a game changer. Thank you once again, Meta, for being here and just for doing this incredible work. You're making such a huge impact. 53 million people. Wow. Brilliant. All right. I'm going to hand it back over to Lisana. Go ahead and introduce our next panelist and ask him this question that you have for him. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. And also, I'm very lucky to hear that we're still not hopeless. Um, it's also nice to hear that. Uh, and I must say that I also have the app, so, um, and it's available here in the Netherlands as well. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce the next speaker. I'm also very excited to hear what he has to say, Ken West. Uh, he's Reefer Digital Development Manager at Maersk, like the huge ships, uh, which are also here in Rotterdam, sometimes in the harbor, um, quite a lot, actually. Uh, very interesting to see as well. Uh, but my question to you is, uh, well, global supply chains are suffering major bottlenecks. Um, and also this is affecting food transport and food supplies around the world, uh, food surpluses or food that cannot be delivered, for instance. Um, the global supply disruptions uh, have also been a source adding to food price inflation and no doubt are also a cause of increased food loss and waste. Um, and my question to you is, uh, how is Maersk dealing with these supply bottlenecks that we are experiencing now, and especially uh, to prevent current and future problems exacerbating food loss and waste along supply chains? Thanks for the question, Lisanne, and, uh, and thanks for, for inviting me uh, to this uh, seminar. Um, definitely, global supply chains have been disrupted, uh, in particular our sector of container logistics since the start of the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, at Maersk, we were trying to alleviate the situation by being as transparent as possible uh, with our customers, especially customers shipping perishable uh, cargo, um, and transparent both in the terms of our communication, but then we are in fact also able to give customers visibility to the current state uh, of their uh, temperature controlled containers, what we refer to as, as reefer containers. Uh, we have a, a fleet of reefer containers which are connected with the uh, IoT, Internet of Things uh, devices that allows us to get information uh, about temperature and humidity levels measured inside the container as well as the GPS location, uh, both when the container is inland uh, and also uh, when it's out at the deep sea. And, and this insight enables our customers to take some mitigating actions in case things are not going according to plan. Uh, and customers, they can thereby optimize their supply chain and, and ultimately reduce uh, food loss. Another thing is also that we are, as was mentioned also uh, as one of the, the key points um, in, in the beginning of the seminar is to, to kind of expand the infrastructure that we have available. We are at the moment also from our side trying to heavily invest and expand in the number of cold storage facilities that we can offer to customers, which is necessary infrastructure to, to maintain global supply chains that when they are disrupted, we might need to then speed up or, or slow down uh, the, the delivery. Uh, so those are some of the things that, uh, that we're trying to address. 
Amazing. Good. And does it also work with the uh, solar panels on it? The cold chain? No, not yet, not yet. But it, it might be something that that we are looking into. Um, the, our reefer containers are, are powered uh, on, so so you have uh, power there. But for the dry or general cargo containers, that might be something we we want to look into. Yes. Awesome. And my second question to you is um, on food loss throughout the value chain. How do you prevent it um, with the reefers? And how do you see this considering also yeah, the energy and environmental footprint of cargo shipping uh, and also the environmental and energy crisis that we're in now and have been in already uh, and the cold chain infrastructure in general? I think uh, I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity in in being more intelligent about uh, the data we have available. Uh, as I mentioned, we we had this flow of temperature and other details from our, our library for shipments, which enables us internally in Merck to take better care of customers' cargo. Previously, we had uh, people doing manual inspections of the containers, either when they were on board the vessels or in terminals to check if everything was okay several times for, uh, throughout the day. Now we have the opportunity to see right away which containers might require uh, attention and, and thereby reduce the risk of, of having any, any cargo impact. Uh, but we have ambitions to be even more uh, proactive and, and intelligent about our cargo care. Uh, we have a lot of expertise within our company when it comes to transporting perishable cargo, uh, we have local so-called reefer specialists, and we are heavily engaged with research institutes, universities, and container manufacturers on, on innovation projects in relation to smarter ways of transporting perishable cargo. Um, I think in, in addition, sensor technology uh, is growing rapidly in, in the market today and, uh, and becoming much more affordable to stakeholders in the supply chain, which means that we are able to collect more a more real-time data about each container shipment. And, and this data enables us to, for example, apply some machine learning and some data models uh, to do precise estimations of shelf life. And, um, and with these estimations, uh, we and our customers uh, are then able to, to take even earlier and better decisions to, to optimize the, the global supply chains for, for fresh produce. Thanks a lot. So I hear a lot about data-driven decision-making. Uh, and I also read on your website that you're working with a university here in the Netherlands as well. Um, so that's uh, very interesting to hear. So maybe I will uh, see it around sometime. Uh, and with that, I yeah, uh, thanks again. And I would like to continue then uh, by giving the floor back to Rachel, which will wrap up a little bit of this panel discussion. And thank also again to all the speakers. Um, and then we will continue to the question and answer. But first, to you, Rachel. Thank you to all of our panelists for your brilliance, your commitment, your activism, and your action. Uh, we're just so inspired, and we, we've learned a lot. <laughs> Lisanna, I don't know if it's just me. I learned so much today, um, and I love to learn personally. So there are a few things that stood out, and Lisanna, feel free to chime in with some of the things that you learned. or. But it's one that we have to start with the consumers. So we're here and we're hearing from people who are within these industries, but all of them are letting us know that we are the most important part of this entire thing. And so that's, that's been something that stood out to me and a commonality that I've seen in every single panelist today. Um, so I think it's very key that we start to take responsibility for ourselves and our actions and our own education, the resources are certainly out there. So I plan to do a bit more. Um, another thing that stood out to me was that 44% of food producers lost. That's a very, very big amount. That's humongous. It's almost half. Um, and while some of us may be familiar with this statistic, what puts it in perspective for me or makes it even more serious is something that was mentioned earlier, which is that people are dying of hunger. People are starving to death. And if 44% of the food produced is lost, how is that, how it how does, uh, blows my mind, makes no sense. So we definitely need to start implementing some solutions as expressed earlier. We've come up with many, many solutions, but the implementation now 
the action needs to start happening, not just the speaking. Um, Lisanna, how about you? Did anything stand out to you? Well, also on the, on, the, on the part on transparency, I think that's also very important that we need to have it clear what is lost and uh, where it is in the chain. And also uh, what I find very interesting to hear on the cold chain infrastructure and what, what actually the role is that. Um, also, we heard uh, from farmers that actually could re improve their, uh, their value of their crops by six times from 10 to 60, I think, cents per kilo it was, or at least by six times. Um, and yeah, I think that's quite massive if you think it's just something we can, we already have available and we can use it already. Um, and I think also to that we can be united around this crisis and really yeah. work together and also connect the dots in the several actors and players that are in the field. And um, that's also something that stood out for me. Um, but I think with that, it's time to continue to our question and answer with our virtual audience um, because they have been waiting. And I think they all uh, have some really pressing questions to this mm -hmm. panel. Um, so, Rachel, would you be willing to ask the first question? All right, this first question and panelists, I hope you're still with us, still awake, still ready, because these questions are not easy questions. If you thought ours were easy or difficult, you're in for something serious. <laughs> so here we go. The first one is for Theo de Jaeger. Hi, Theo. Welcome to the hot seat. Tum, tum, tum. First question for you is a question that I myself have had several times. It comes from Dylan Messling in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Shout out to Tulsa. The question is, can going vegan reduce food waste? It's only animal-based proteins that is lost or wasted, and it is not. I firmly believe that it is not the case. I firmly believe that going vegan can actually add to food loss and waste if you look at the complexities in the value chain. You see, when you cut out animal-based proteins, you centralize power in the value chain. Because any smallholder farmer in Cameroon and Gabon who has one cow can also make butter. But to make the, 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 the plant-based alternative to it, margarine, you need a complicated factory. You need high technology. You need a comprehensive distribution system. And there are billions of farmers in Africa and Latin America and Southeast Asia who simply do not have access to that. So my, my short answer would be, no, I don't think so. I think we need an integrated food system in which there is enough protein accessible and cheap enough for the whole world to enjoy. We need to bring down that number of 811 million people who do not know what they will have to eat tonight. And in this process, we need to put the special emphasis on the nutrition of pregnant women and children below the age of two, even in the poorest corners of the world. Well said, Theo. That was very helpful for me personally, <laughs> very educational. Thank you so much. Lisana, you can go ahead and ask the next question. Yeah, so the next question is for Maximo Torero. Uh, it's from Martin van Ginkel. Um, and from his name, perhaps he's also from the Netherlands. I know someone with the same last name, so perhaps. <laughs> um, but uh, the question is, uh, the drop from 30% losses to 13% is huge. Uh, and hard to believe, so a little bit critical in that way. Uh, what's the way losses are measured? Is it changed? Okay, Th thank you. Thank you so much. The, the important thing uh, when we measure losses, and, and you saw the variance across the different regions, so I don't think it's huge to believe. But what we need to understand when we measure losses is not just quantity losses, which was initially the way it was measured. It's also about quality losses. Because when you sell a commodity and the commodity doesn't comply with the attributes and the requirements of the market, then you will have 
a, a punishment in the market for that commodity. And that's a loss. That's an economic value that this loss in that commodity because the price of the commodity in optimal con conditions incorporates all the inputs that were used on the labor force, the soil, the land, and so on and so forth, as much as there is a market for those. And therefore, any punishment of the commodity will be affecting. So if you combine quantity and quality, you get a, a significant amount of cases where you have significant level of losses. Now, in many countries of the world, especially in the poorest ones, markets don't have necessarily those standards, and they don't value those. But that's something that we need to keep improving, but it's essential to measure quantity and quality losses. And if we do that, I don't have any doubt that we are capturing the number, the number uh, in, in its correct magnitude, even especially in high value commodities, uh, the magnitudes could be even higher because those are the commodities where the standards and the attributes are the highest. And therefore, if you don't comply with those, you have to assume that those is a loss in the value of the commodity. Thanks a lot. That's really, uh, that really gives a clear idea. I hope also Martin is answer is, uh, Martin, Martin uh, yeah, is uh, happy with his answer. And I would like to give the floor then back to Rachel for the second one, the next one. Thank you, Lisano. This next one is for Yolanda. It comes from Isaac Biarugaba. Biarugaba, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. The question is, I love this question. How can the youth with innovations focusing on improving food security be heard? For example, a colleague and I came up with an idea we hope to aid in control of aflatoxins. Ooh, sounds great. But Yolanda, that one's for you. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I find that youth uh, and uh, their capacity to create and innovate is one of the main sectors in the solution uh, process in identifying the how to. I think we all know what to do, but how to do is, uh, I believe, in the hands of people who have the creativity to design applications to mobilize society. When I visit food banks, for example, it's mainly youth. It's mainly youth who have very strong values related to, to the human values that I mentioned before, solidarity, um, that can that have no problem in smelling and touching and tasting food that others would think should go to waste. So um, youth, it is a lot in your hands in mobilizing communities, your neighborhood, your school, your university, your club, your sports group. Uh, those are the areas in which I find that we in my generation don't have the energy anymore or not sufficient energy and where youth can contribute plus technology. That's that really great. <laughs> right? And she yeah. was like, I don't have that much energy anymore. Meanwhile, Yolanda's on like a thousand percent energy. <laughs> Yolanda. <laughs> um, but thank you for that. And thank you for deferring to us, the youth. Lisana, you could go ahead and ask the next one. Yeah. So uh, next one, actually, I want to ask to Meta. Um, also relates a little bit to the smelling that Yolanda just talked about, but um, yeah. The question to you, Mette, is um, how do you ensure food safety while addressing food loss and waste? Uh, yeah, so, so on our platform, we have 100,000 stores, and these are all stores you know, who operate food business all day long. Um, and the food that is saved on the Too Good To Go platform is food that was you know, bought at full price five minutes earlier. Uh, so the way the platform works is that you basically you you open the app and you see what's nearby, what what's your favorite restaurant, bakery, whatever, and then you reserve it on the app and then you go and pick it up when the store is shutting down for the day. So there's there's really I mean there's nothing wrong with the food. I mean those five minutes uh, are, are are not kind of really bad for that food. It's fine, uh, and it is it is sold like normal food and the quality is fine. It's just that. The quality is a lot uh, or is significantly lower on the next day and and i mean it's not practice for them to sell it on the day after 
So it's it's the same food safety uh, that you would normally have, and uh, and it is the store's responsibility, of course, to uh, to deliver uh, safe food. Yeah, and you can still smell and taste if it's okay. <laughs> I mean, definitely for best before product, do that. Uh, for used by products, uh, the, the right recommendation still is to uh, to throw it away past the date. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Rachel, would you like to take the second question? The I next. would. This next one is for Dr. Voss. Rob, this question comes from Dr. Pitambar Dahal from the University of California, Davis. My best friend goes to UC Davis. The question is, floods, rainfall damage, dry foods annually at farms. Right, so floods and rainfall damage dry foods annually at farms. Could a dry chain minimize dry product loss at farms and enable quality products even for disasters? Uh, great question. Um, uh, yeah, the short answer is I think yes, it, it can, of course. Uh, uh, of course, depends on when the floods and rainfall uh, happens, right? When it's uh, uh, pre-harvest, uh, during harvest, uh, or post-harvest. Uh, but certainly, if it's post-harvest and uh, with better storage, with um, uh, with properly uh, um, sealed bags to store foods uh, and in, in in the dry chain, that could uh, certainly help reduce food losses. Um, but just come back to the point I made during my short uh, intervention. Then you also have to look at what happens um, further down the supply chain. So uh, the experience that we've seen with uh, with those kinds of solutions, then the entire dry chain should work. So if subsequently, you've saved the foods um, through the proper handling, could be the sealed bags, but then if it goes to the open market, and then the traders open up the bags and it's in the full sun and humidity, then still a lot of food can get lost. So it, uh, it's about behaviors uh, and incentives across the entire chain uh, to make things work uh, properly. And uh, if not, then uh, yeah, then we could still have food losses, even if we have found a solution that works at the farm level, but doesn't work uh, so well uh, further down the supply chain. All right. Thank you for that, Rob. Lisano, over to you. Yeah, my next question is for Maximo from Margarita Cozan. Um, if our goal of food waste reduction is achieved, is the food supply chain prepared to handle the distribution of all food saved? And what are the research and preparations needed? Um, has this work already been started? So, oh, thank thanks. you, thank you, uh, thank you for for the question. Very important question because if we look at the food today and the world food today, uh, in terms of starchy foods are uh, uh, and calories, the world produces enough food to basically supply the minimum calories that every individual needs in the world, and that clearly is not happening. Which means that there is a problem of logistics of mobility of food and access to food in terms of income. If we look even at high value commodities. Uh, then we see that we are not there yet, but we are around 70 to 80 percent of availability of all the different food groups. But there are regions in the world where that is not available because of access. No, that's why we have three billion people without access to healthy diets. So if we are able to reduce food losses, which to reduce to zero is impossible, we need to be careful here because there are technical losses that will have to happen and the most efficient producer will have technical losses. But assume that we achieve SDG, SDG 12.3. No? So we reduce waste to 50 percent. Uh, 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 and we reduce also losses, although there is not a target, but let's assume that we are able to reduce it. Uh, that will in increase the supply of food available in the world, but especially will increase the supply of high value commodities, which are essential for access to healthy diets. And let's be careful that uh, a vegetarian diet is not a healthy diet. Uh, Mediterranean diets are healthy diets, for example. Uh, now, if we increase the supply, we could have more of the availability of the different food groups for access to healthy diets in the world. And it could be that the cost of access to healthy diet will be reduced, but that doesn't assure at all that we will be able to satisfy the needs of the world because there is huge inequalities in the world. And many countries and regions of the world won't be able to afford those healthy diets, which will be cheaper. So the way we need to see this is that there will be an improvement and they will be getting us closer. Also, of course, farmers, if they sell in local, local markets, 
and there is more supply, they could be affected uh, because they will, the prices could go down. But what needs to be done there is to improve the standards, because if you differentiate the product by attribute the standards, then of course the prices, the farmers could make more money and differentiate the commodity. But clearly we will be more efficient in terms of the use of our natural resources, and we will be reducing emissions, not only on the losses side, but on the waste side is even bigger because all the food waste that is end in incinerated and so on creates enormous amount of methane emissions. So it will be a triple win again, as I said uh, before, but we cannot assume that reducing the number we have of losses today or waste will allow us to have access to healthy diets to everybody because of the huge inequalities we live. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, certainly. Um, I certainly agree with this. And I would like to give to Rachel the floor to take this, the next question. Thanks, Lisana. Okay, the next question will be for Ken. Ken, I know you were waiting anxiously <laughs> for your question. <laughs> this one is from Michael Bullen, Rural Development Program Manager in the UK. His question is, what are some leading food waste prevention initiatives, national, regional, or sectoral, that represent good models to examine or follow? Um, thanks for the question, uh, Michael. I guess we, within our industry, we are very much focused about um, giving some flexibility in the supply chain. Um, so, so, so by having, as coming back to my point around data, the, 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 the more real-time data we have, the better decisions and the earlier decisions uh, we can take. Um, so, so you can say an example would be that that our customers of, of ours have access to information about their banana shipment, which is on board one of our vessels uh, today. Uh, they might see a temperature deviation. Uh, it could be that there has been a container malfunction and the vessel crew might not have the spare part to, uh, to fix it on board the vessel. By knowing this already, a customer could take then a mitigating action and ask Merck to offload the container at the next port because it's not gonna make it all the way to the end destination. Um, thereby the customer is hopefully able to at least sell his food in a different uh, market and thereby uh, reduce uh, the, the food or that could have been lost um, so these are some of the kind of the aspects uh, that we are trying to enable our customers to take these mitigating actions by having data available uh, but also helping our customers interpret and use the data in, in a clever way. Um, so, so that's very much where we are at this point in time. Awesome. Thank you for that. We hope to be some of the ones that use the data in a clever way for sure. I'm going to hand it over back to Lisanne. Thank you. And also really like the banana story because here they have a, in the Netherlands, they have, for instance, initiatives around banana uh, fibers. So another way to prevent or reduce food loss by using it in a different way if you have loss or waste in a certain product. Uh, and I would like to take the last or ask the last question uh, for Theo. Uh, and the question comes from Thomas O'Donnell, O'Donnell, if I pronounce it correctly, um, from Usepa Nahe. Um, and the question is, getting real data on unharvested food produce loss is very difficult. How can farmers be asked to let people measure their unharvested food on their own farm? And it's, it's all about the, the fact that you cannot manage what you cannot measure. It will be impossible to reduce food loss if we do not find a way to have data with integrity on the basis of which we can try to reduce. Now, for, for, for farmers to um, get that data into a facility where it can be harvested, processed, interpreted, and then fed back to the farms, you need to organize them. Actually, I believe that the era has dawned on us where we need to turn our farmers' organizations across the world into data harvesting machines. It is impossible for anyone to go from farm gate to farm gate to collect the data. And the only real alternative 
is to create one big a gate where, where you can enter to access all the data. And that would be in a farmer's organization. And data is the new gold in agriculture, not only on food loss and waste, but also on so many other aspects of production and food security. So my first step would be to empower farmers' organizations to be these data harvesting machines, and then to ensure that the ownership of the data remains with the farmers. As long as farmers own the data, they will trust it better than when they believe it has been harvested by someone else, interpreted by someone else, and then left up there in the cloud. Now, up there in the cloud, it would be accessible to anyone. And the most important person who needs the access is actually the farmer himself. Because even if we forget everything we have said about the food loss part, the part that goes um, beyond where it meant to go on the farm. This is the important part. No one can do as much about it as the farmers themselves, but they need the assistance. They need the empowerment to do so. And most importantly, they need to buy into that dream and buy into the dream is a communications exercise. Thanks a lot for this, uh, this final answer of this question. Um, and with that, I would like to, well, not like, but because we could have talked for hours, I think, uh, on this topic, but um, I need to wrap up um, and I would like to continue to the, or go to the next part of this, uh, this seminar. Uh, the final part of this, uh, and I would like to give the floor to Rachel to introduce our last speaker for the closing remarks. I cannot believe we're already at the close. <laughs> there were so many other amazing questions that we weren't able to get to today, but thank you all for your participation, for your passion, for your commitment to decreasing food loss and waste. We can tell just how involved and serious you are about this through your questions and just through everything throughout this whole event. Thank you once again to the panelists for your brilliance, your knowledge and your commitment once again. I'd like to introduce Craig Hansen, who will give our closing remarks. He's the Vice President for Food, Forest, Water and the Ocean at the World Resources Institute, WRI. Craig, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thanks for being here. Great, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you for a phenomenal moderation of this event. Of this event. Rachel, you and Lizanne, fantastic. Um, just want to close, thank you very much for all participating. Just have three, three closing remarks. One is the issue of food loss and waste is urgent. And we've heard it today from colleagues, but just look around you in the world, right? Um, we know the numbers, they're big, as, as Rachel was mentioning, but food security, is fundamental and given the crisis in ukraine is going to be even more of an issue i just saw yesterday latest data from the fao uh i see maximo here on here thank you maximo for fao and the great stuff fao does the i don't know if you've seen this chart it shows basically global food prices um we're back at the number of where we were in 2011 and 2014 the two most recent spikes which at that level and as we know that causes a lot of misery for a lot of people uh, it's no, and it's no uh, surprise, like in 2007, 2008, and that price spike, that's the time that FAO launched its seminal report looking at and getting the basic first set of numbers on where we are in food loss and waste around the world, because those high prices really put an attention on this issue. I think we can't control what's happening in certain parts of the world, but we can make sure that we put this issue on the agenda. And I think with the price spikes we're seeing right now and going to see continuously probably through the rest of this year, now is the time to really double down on food loss and waste as a means of addressing this and helping to relieve many people who otherwise would be facing misery. We, we have to capture this moment and really drive this agenda, uh, given the, the, the food insecurity and price implications happening in the world right now. And I don't need to talk about climate as well. You know, we're still facing a climate crisis. Food loss and waste can help you address that. But I do think we're facing a big food security and price issue today. So urgency is important. Secondly, solutions exist. We've heard it today from across the value chain. We've heard about farmers from Theo, logistics from Maersk, you know, 
uh, retail stores uh, from too good to go and consumers, there are solutions out there. We don't have to invent something brand new. We're not waiting for a silver bullet. We have lots of silver buckshot out there. The game really is how do you drive adoption and scaling of those solutions? And finally, I wanna challenge each and every one of you to ask yourself this question, what new are you gonna do differently after this conversation? We've spent two years going to events, going to webinars like this. And once we click off in two minutes, we're gonna go back to our day jobs. I'd encourage us all to do something different. Commit yourself to doing one thing that's not just part of your day job, but something additional that you are gonna do or your organization gonna do to actually help drive this agenda so the world can actually reduce food loss and waste even more given the urgency of this, of this crisis. So let me conclude with that. I wanna thank the, I wanna thank all the panelists and the speakers, fantastic job. I wanna thank the co-organizers, IFPRI, the Embassy of Denmark to the United States, Mangatak, to my colleagues at WRI and to Champions 12.3 for pulling this together. I know it's a lot of work, but it's super important to do. And finally, I wanna thank you, our audience. This doesn't mean anything unless you're here. The rest of us can talk to each other any point in time. We do talk to each other. It's you, the audience, that are super important. So please, everyone, do challenge yourself to one new thing to drive this agenda. With that, I thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. Craig. <laughs> Lisana says thank you as well. We're all just incredibly grateful to be here today. And I want to tell you personally on air, I am committed to making a change in my life. Personally, I will do something differently. Not sure what yet, <laughs> but I will do something for sure. Um, as you've mentioned, it's been two years. We've just been on calls like this. And I guess a silver lining around this dark cloud of food loss and waste is that there are solutions. We just have to implement them now. So Lisana, with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you everyone for being us, being with us today. Um, Lisana, over to you. And for me as well, I will certainly start doing something. Not sure what yet, but certainly will do something. And with that, I would like to end with an invite to you all. Also another event um, to join IFPRI on March 22. Uh, at 9.30 a.m. EST for the book launch, Food for All, International Organizations and the Transformation of Agriculture. Really excited. Um, yeah. And with that, I would like to end this session. Thank you all for watching and I hope to see you another time. Bye.